Dr. Shauna Colson is an Associate Professor of Cognitive Science at the University of California, San Diego, which heads the Brain and Cognition Laboratory. Her research focuses primarily on understanding how the brain makes meaning and uses analysis techniques from cognitive semantics and experiments in which event-related brain potentials are recorded from healthy adults reading texts, listening to speech, or watching videos. She has played a key role in the field of cognitive linguistics by developing the theory of conceptual blending, which she has applied to explain some aspects of metaphor, jokes, and analogical reasoning. In the past few years, one major research focus in the Brain and Cognition Lab is the role that gesture plays in language comprehension. More recently, her lab has begun research on the neural basis of synesthesia and the extent to which language comprehension is subconscious. Well, cognitive linguistics is a field of linguistics where one of the core tenets is that uh, language is an essential part of cognition and that there's no firm line that you can draw between language and cognition. Uh, and this kind of departs from uh, what one of the main schools of linguistics, of generative linguistics, that sort of sees language as being a formal system and that it's somewhat isolated from other cognitive systems. Um, but, you know, besides just this general commitment to languages being part of the cognitive system, uh, there are a couple other tenets that kind of set cognitive linguistics apart. Uh, and one thing is the idea that your knowledge of language is based on the usage of language. So it's called this usage-based approach to language. Uh, and that it, your knowledge of language sort of has to do with abstractions from individualized discourse events. Uh, so, you know, we're in some communicative situation and there are some sounds that are made or in the case of sign language, there are some movements that the speaker makes uh, and some meaning is attributed to it. And that from a variety of different usage examples, you draw some abstractions and that's where your knowledge comes from. And so the other big things are viewing grammar as pairings between form and meaning. So uh, there's the phonological form of the speech or the sign, uh, and then there's the meaning that's conveyed. Uh, and it's these pairings that you're learning uh, and not some abstract uh, rule. Um, and then the last thing is the idea of meaning as being located in conceptual structure, that the way to establish a meaning is to activate a, a concept. Uh, and so that goes back to the original tenet of language and cognition being intimately intertwined. Well, in some sense, conceptual blending is a theory of concepts. Uh, and it draws on particular aspects of cognitive semantics and mental space theory. Um, and the basic idea is that when you understand things, you're always combining information from different domains uh, and information from different aspects of the, of the context. So there are no sort of canonical meanings that are always evoked, that you're always doing kind of improvisation uh, in constructing meaning. Uh, and the basic idea is that you're creating these very simple cognitive models when you understand things. And what we tend to do is uh, build these hybrid cognitive models that have some aspects from multiple different domains, and we combine them in very creative ways. Uh, well, my interest in humor is really more interest in how people understand jokes, so narrative jokes that people tell one another, although just the general issue of humor is very uh, compelling, obviously. But uh, I sort of got interested because I was reading a book by Marvin Minsky, um, and he was talking about how understanding a joke involves kind of a, a rapid change in the, the frames, or these data structures that you use for understanding knowledge. Uh, and I thought that studying joke comprehension would be a great way to sort of get at the way that people are always using background knowledge uh, to guide their interpretation of language. Um, 
because you have a discrete linguistic event that triggers this process of frame shifting where you know everything in the setup to a joke will lead you to expect something based on your background knowledge about the sort of scenario that's being evoked. Uh, but then often with a single word, uh, you can dramatically change somebody's appraisal of the situation and cause them to activate a new frame that can incorporate all the previous information that they took in, uh, often with very different you know, social significance. So a lot of jokes turn on kind of taboo things. So that it initially promotes a very straightforward reading, and then you get some information that leads you to believe, like, oh, one guy is actually a bad guy; he's cheating on his wife, or, or whatever. Okay. Well, the event-related brain potential is a measure uh, that's kind of a derivation of the EEG signal. Uh, so what we do in our lab is we put electrodes on people's scalp and people often will ask us, are you going to shave my head? No, we're not allowed to shave your head, you know. Um, they, we have this thing, a guy I used to work with called the thinking cap. It's kind of like a swim cap that has electrodes sewn into it. And so the electrodes sit on the top of your head and uh, we put saline gel into the electrodes that enables us to make good contact and we record the electrical activity uh, of your brain through your scalp. So just like they would do at the hospital if you were being tested for a seizure disorder or if you were doing a sleep study or something like that. Uh, and the difference between EEG and the, the event-related potential, or ERP, uh, is that the ERP is, is electrical activity that's time-locked to the presentation of some kind of uh, either sensory, cognitive, or motoric event. So in my lab, it's usually reading a word. So we present a written word, and what we do is we uh, average the EEG response to the onset of uh, a bunch of different words, like maybe 50 different words. And we'll, what we do is just average the EEG signal, and what this gives you is a predictable series of positive and negative peaks. Uh, that have been correlated over the years with different kinds of perceptual uh, and cognitive activity. Uh, and so this, these, this series of peaks is what we refer to as the ERP. And you can uh, look at different kinds of events and look at the traces that you get uh, for different kinds of events. So if we're doing this reading study, we might look at all the nouns versus all the verbs, or uh, all the verbs that have to do with maybe thinking or uh, cognitive activity versus all verbs that have to do with maybe physical activity. See if there's some difference in the brain's reaction to those different kinds of verbs. Uh, and so it's really good for uh, looking for differences in cognitive activity that happen in some rapid series of action. So there are other brain imaging techniques that are better for looking at things cognitive activity to unfold over a long time frame, like experiencing an emotion. Uh, but uh, EEG, the strength of it is it's temporal resolution. You can see changes in brain activity on a millisecond by millisecond uh, level. Uh, and so that's why uh, speech and language researchers really love it, because the language signal unfolds very rapidly, and it's all about rapid changes over time, that if you have a an imaging technique with a, a lower temporal resolution, it's all just going to wash out. You're just going to see, oh, that's, this is the brain's response to speaking. And, you know, we're more interested in, oh, this is a man speaking versus a woman speaking, or this is somebody speaking quickly versus speaking slowly.